uh, that music was composed. It was from the movie, a 2015 movie called Dare to Be Wild, and it's called the Chelsea Theme, composed by Con Mac Con. The movie is based actually on a true story, and it's the journey of an outsider, Mary Reynolds, who at the age of 28 beat other entrants like the Prince Charles to win the Chelsea Flower Show uh, in England uh, in 2002. Her garden was composed of weeds, rabbit droppings, and giant stones. Her work since and before is littered with Celtic symbols, and has changed the notion of the idea of the garden in England and Ireland. Good afternoon, I'm Aniket Bhagwat, and on behalf of all of us at Leaf, welcome you to the third episode of Saturday Sir Jones: Modern Landscape Architecture in India. Firstly, let me thank the many people who have joined us as audience, and I do hope all of you stay interested and come back every week. The webinar will be held every Saturday for the next three weeks. Registration links for each episode will be put up on Monday of the week, so please do come back, and we would love to have you and do tell your colleagues and friends. I have in the first two episodes tried to explain the reasons for this webinar. Today, in the interest of saving time and not repeating myself, let me just say that this webinar is about listening to young, younger professionals in India, but also about reorienting the directions of the profession. Every week, we will have two officers present their work, each for a period not exceeding 20 minutes. So, in all, 12 firms, six weeks. In the last session, Hemali, Pritanshi, and Shantesh presented. The discussions then left, left, let us contemplate manners of praxis, of ways of working on projects, of being inspired and learning from local traditions, of working with minimal resources, also of making something special out of any opportunity presented, but also of imagining a different connection to the world and of examining, expanding, and questioning the etymological meanings of the many acts. that help us in making the pedagogical structures of this discipline for today's session we are joined by anjali jain who founded a studio shared ground in 2012 she also teaches at set at the landscape department her presentation today is titled wandering around in search of places that hold moments that reveal and passages that connect our second presenter is madhusudan He is the founder or the co-founder of Made, a Hyderabad-based but literally a practice that is seeded all over the world that got established in 2007. Madhu wishes to make it clear that he does not see himself as a landscape architect, and in our earlier conversation just a few seconds back, was wondering whether he sees himself even as an architect, and he needed much convincing to join these seminars. I was insistent. not only because i like his work but more importantly the way he has structured his practice and it's interesting and furthermore his work sits on the intersection of architecture urbanism and landscape design his presentation today is titled between landscapes and buildings we have with us a distinguished group who have been with us in the last two sessions there has been professor basauda Mr Rajiv Kapalia Professor Sneel Nagar Sheikh Dr Meghal Arya Dean De Cruz so thank you again for joining us this time and joining us for the first time today is Professor Neil Kanchaya he is the co-founder of the Mandala Design Services and after a 25 year teaching sojourn where he was a much popular teacher in 2013 he retired as dean of the faculty of architecture at set and since then is a teacher and a thinker at large helping innumerable institutions across the country find their directions and teaching design in many different geographies welcome chai and of course as in the previous two sessions sunit mohendra joins me in moderating this session too so thank you everybody welcome and over to you anjali hello everyone i'm anjali thank you for providing this platform to enable me to share my work and thoughts my talk today is titled wandering around in search of places that hold moments that reveal and passages that connect 
as someone who practices landscape architecture, one of the primary tasks I am engaged in is of making gardens, gardens and design landscapes. And at the start of every project is the question, what should this garden do? Indeed, what should gardens do? From amongst the many responses that I have come across, some helped clarify this question more than others. One of them is the sentence by Dan Pearson. This is where gardens play their part for they allow us to access landscape and nature and to a degree feel part of it. End of quote. I think that they should allow us to dwell and probably should create a setting that allows us to look around. But then this to my mind implies an awareness of both the larger landscape, environment, nature, as well as a place within it to inhabit. So apart from the making of gardens, one of the things that preoccupy the mind many times is the larger landscape that we are within and to be able to make sense of it in a way that is more than just a sum of its parts on geology, topography and vegetation. Sometimes and usually while just wandering around, you find a place or a moment that opens a window. It tells you what the place is like or would have been like inherently in its uncultivated state. It reveals what is at home here. It tells you all this and more through a very visceral and sensorial experience. Simultaneously, it evokes both memory and imagination. However, as landscape architects, we, in the words of Dennis Cosgrove, start of quote, inhabit both the unalienated insider's apprehension of the land, of nature and the sense of place, together with a more critical, socially conscious, outsider's perspective, what he calls the landscape way of seeing, end of quote. Thus, there is a search for moments that reveal the nature of place in all its specificities. While this seems to be straightforward, such instants are perhaps not that many. But the moment you are face to face with one such place, usually the recognition is immediate, with a sense that everything here belongs together in this particular location and for a long duration. It completely engages your senses and your body. It reveals its stories of its sights, sounds and smells, the many creatures that live in it and also how you can inhabit it. These places are not only in the wild or the wilderness, but also ones that have seen human agency in ways that have somehow tapped into the rhythms of the place and responded to them in many ways. And the quest for finding such places and moments is literal and physical. Apart from the accidental discoveries, one of the more constructive ways in which it has happened is through the landscape foundation studio that I have been engaged with for the last couple of years. For this studio, we have been delving into the idea of the forest. We have been engaging with this primeval and archaic landscape entity of the forest for both confrontation and immersion with the landscape as well as an examination of its layers of location, topography, soil and vegetation. While we use many methods of engaging with the forest, the most rigorous is through drawing in many ways. The first is that of recollecting experience of its depth and impenetrability of its light and volumes, of its unfathomable abundance at all scales and expanding it to enter the forest through the drawing. Then we start the unpeeling of all the layers and the juxtaposition of the two of what you felt and remember and what it is made of. We also look at how these points in space are connected to larger systems. But no preparation is enough when you walk into the actual forest. It engulfs you, weighs you in, opens 
opens things up and awakens you. Then you need to restart the process for making sense of it all. Reading and recording the site, its experiences and breaking down the components, drawing the site as is, reconstructing it to make sense of the many experiences, analyzing it to understand the larger processes at work and their extents, and eventually using it to reflect upon with hopefully a greater level of awareness this multidimensional spatial ecological entity and its space in human imagination. At the other end of the spectrum of things is the city. While it is relatively easier to find moments of revelation with respect to nature and its places in a forest or a jungle, is it possible to find the same in the proximity of urbanity? If yes, what are they and what will they tell us? Will they just re reveal what must have been or also tell us what can be? This is a question that we pose for ourselves as we set out to look at Andhapan. Again, this is part of a studio that, uh, that I was engaged in last, last semester. And this time again, it began by literally wandering around from east to west, from north to south. And the city has expanded. So the extents that we looked at stretch from the Khari River to the east, from in the east to Nalsarovar in the west. While we know the landscape is one that belongs to the river and to the many small lakes, the characters vary and there are many rivers and many, many lakes. And also there are places that hold water to different degrees. All these places are sometimes amplified by the layers of cultivation of that place or sometimes they are erased. As we looked, we found remnants that told us of what was perhaps there earlier, the river, the wetland and its varied inhabitants. But we also found places where the human agency had placed intersections to cultivate places of inhabitation. Some we all know, like the buns to create large reservoirs, canals and many others that we had not come across earlier. We found groves or trees along seasonal water streams and another river between the Sabarmati and the Nalsarova. This is the Rod River. And digging into history, some of the snapshots that we found transported us to perhaps what can only be described as another place in another time. Stitching these together became crucial to see things as a whole, to understand what part fit where and when. To do this, we mapped all the natural features of the city, rivers, seasonal rivers, lakes, seasonal water bodies, low-lying areas that catch the water, direct it, apart from the canals, gardens and some of the remnants of wilderness. This then became the basis for reconstructing, synthesizing and imagining places that connected across scales and time. Some of these questions and methods also spill over to practice and the attempt is to figure out what was and what can be there while cultivated, abandoned and designed, to create a palette to draw from. More often than not, it's the literal wandering around again that helps. At other times, it's need, it needs to be constructed from secondary sources. And to describe this further, I'm using two projects, one that is still on the boards and the other that was completed a few years ago. The first one is in Marathwada, located on an intriguing piece of land. This one we have worked on essentially through the lockdown and had to rely on secondary sources and of course all the tools available to us as landscape architects. The photographs we received showed clearly a small stream and reservoir within an undulating piece of land that had no large trees. Google map immediately indicated a barren looking distinct entity within a large agricultural landscape. All these photographs and also talking to some other colleagues, uh, one of them being a taxonomist, revealed that what we were looking at is probably a grassland 
with rocky terrain below. Thus, we had a very specific palette to work with, dense vegetation near the water, specific trees on the ridges and the rest a range of grasses. The grassland is important because it is home to many species which cannot otherwise survive. The first design interventions have thus so far been about intensifying the existing and using it as a base palette to define and carve out places to occupy and enjoy the landscape without losing a sense of the vastness that is there. So while this project looks at intensifying the existing experience of the land, the next one takes what seems like an opposite approach. This second project is in Sangamnir, about 30 minutes southwest of Shirdi. The project is essentially a garden around 3500 square meters in area. And one of the first things that I felt there was needed to be done was understand what that place is. Also in terms of what could possibly start growing there. Rainfall again in this part of Maharashtra is very erratic. It ranges from 300 mm to 600 mm annually. The larger landscape around the site consisted of sugarcane fields all around, punctuated with very few pomegranate orchards. But some wandering around re revealed other nuances of the context. Though scattered far and in between, there were thick groves of trees, a range of smaller cultivated mosaics of marigold, chrysanthemum, roses, tube roses, and also many farm ponds. A botanical garden offered further clues. It contained ferns, amaryllis, and many other plants that were growing really well. Finally, it all began to tie up that this is an alluvial landscape that through the act of cultivation offered a bounty of agriculture and horticultural delights. The land has the capacity to produce a wide range of plants through human effort, a range of flowers, vegetables, fruits, trees, in fact everything needed to live and enjoy life. This became the starting point for the design of the landscape of the house. And apart from the usual requirements of a large lawn, thanks to the scale of the project, we could create a few different vignettes that included a large area dedicated to produce edible and sensual pores, roses, mogra, citrus fruit, and many other fruit, and other areas that allowed a more intimate engagement with nature for the inhabitants of the house. For me personally, the process for this particular garden helped clarify the relationship between the land, what occurs there naturally, and a richer, more delightful way of inhabiting that the act of cultivation allows. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anjali. Uh, I think, Anjali, that you would like to sort of add a little bit uh, on the presentation before we can open it up for discussion. So would you like to say something? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the only thing that I wanted to say was uh, I've used both academic and professional projects. Uh, also because, you know, there is really no boundary between, between things, uh, not just academic and professional, but also when you're looking at, you know, just different scales and different, uh, different types of landscapes and spaces, whether it is architecture, landscape, whatever it is. So that's the only thing that I wanted to sort of add sure. in the presentation. No, lovely. I mean, so, you know, Anjali, I've been seeing your work and it's quite beautiful to see how it's becoming more and more gentle and more and more nuanced. So it's quite beautiful to see the work. And also, as you correctly point out, sort of, uh, you know, let both academics and the practice uh, learn from each other. So I think that was particularly well amplified. I'll leave it to you know, Sunit, would you like to sort of take on this, uh, make a comment and invite uh, discussions to sort of participate and opine on this? You're on mute. Yes, so uh, since we've been looking at uh, myriad uh, 
aspects that define the profession and we've been kind of uh, to begin with through the earlier presentations we had a larger range and i think as we go forward we should speak on uh, something which is more particularly not addressed in the earlier ones and becomes a uh, another point for discussion so one thing that uh, uh, that i thought was very um, very thought provoking here was uh, the fact that landscape is also an idea or a representation and how the drawing how the representation of landscape becomes a medium from where the palette and planes both can be discerned so uh, i think both the projects talked about this very uh, emphatically that uh, there are certain palettes that we are working with and then there are certain planes and those planes form spaces uh um, that i thought was uh, something worth discussing here because uh, the 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 art of uh, drawing the art of representation in fact is the tool to bring that out so anjali if you would like to uh, say something more about this as a passion and uh, also uh, to all the panelists if you agree with uh, this peculiarity of the way things were presented here yeah so shall i come in yes of course Yes. yeah so i think uh, i think that presentation uh, is important but i think over the years what has happened is uh, in terms of practice at least uh, the use of that has it, it sort of i mean it goes down because it's a good starting point to sort of train yourself but then after that it's you know once your basic sort of uh, understanding or little you know as you as you maybe grow a little more it's easier to uh, look at things without the use of representation per se but yes i would agree that for a number of years it it becomes very important to uh, as a tool to understand things that are around and i still like even during practice or whenever we are sitting down to design a project so the drawing is a tool to think through it it doesn't matter whether it's uh, whatever it could be uh, just a plan and a bunch of sketches but yes the sort of the uh, i mean what it looks like doesn't it just completely seems to matter but the drawing remains a tool throughout so actually i'm going to sort of before we move on to others i'm going to quickly sort of butt in because uh, incidentally for everybody's sort of knowledge and benefit uh, anjali was the person who guided many of the earlier leaf studies and uh, and she was particularly very very sort of clear precise about how representation should be understood and done so anjali one question for you i mean you know one sees a lot of designers sort of doing beautiful sketches and they're sort of mood sketches they're very evocative sketches and then on the other hand uh, there are some people who do their sketches but they're almost apparatuses they're they're tools they're empirical devices uh, through which you can begin to examine would you like to sort of uh, talk a little bit about the difference between the two or do you see a difference between the two or what is that conversation so yeah i i think it it depends on what you're doing and what what is it that you're trying to get out of things and how you draw how you look at it it and it just all comes from that so what tool you use for uh, one thing might not work for the other thing uh, because when you're designing it's a whole different thing you know you're kind of uh, kind of making things and you still want some things to be left open you don't want it to be defined but whereas your doc when you're documenting something and when you're trying to convey something that is already there then it it becomes more critical to kind of you know put it together in a way that conveys everything that needs to be conveyed and with landscape of course there are so many things it's it's just not like it's not like a, only the figure ground that you're trying to do there are a lot of other things that you're trying to bring in so i think it just comes from what you're trying to do and what is the purpose sure in fact uh, one of the things that i was uh, particularly talking about was the idea of the diagram the diagrammatic tool uh, which uh, which was very apparent uh, rather than the realistic tool so uh, yeah please chaya you chaya has joined us for the first time so chaya would you like to come in i i feel a bit challenged right now so a little later a little uh, later sure um so okay. uh, professor basavda dean yeah, yeah i'd like to go yeah, yeah. 
So I think the first project was uh, had this uh, almost iconic image of that triangular sort of uh, in space of intervention with the water body actually entering it and it looked like a giant lung in a way. And it's so similar. I mean, in, in lungs, we have air actually feeding us and it's water. And in fact, most open spaces in our cities are called you know, lungs to a city. And uh, when we look at forests, we always think of forests of our separate areas outside you know, city limits. And, and I think uh, examples like Central Park in New York is where they've actually preserved the old forest areas and they've kept it, which we rarely see in our cities today. I mean, we seem to displace all of nature for only one creature, which is us, you know. And uh, when we look at landscape, we tend to manicure it to a level which only suits us, you know. So that's really a sad thing that's, that's happening. So can we really achieve uh, this uh, connection between, you know, what we've lost of nature? Can we bring it back into our cities uh, so we can experience, we don't have to go outside our cities to experience, you know, the pristine nature that you know, we all long for in, as city dwellers. So I think that's just a, more than a question that uh, you know, somebody could uh, address. I think, uh, you know, just I, did, I was unaware, but uh, Rahul is here and I didn't introduce him. Uh, so, so Rahul would, would, I'm sorry, Rahul. I didn't know. No, 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 my God. You don't have to. Can I jump in uh, just to yes. pick up on what Dean said? Thanks, yes. Aniket. No, Dean, thank you for the, you know moving in that direction. And Anjali, you know, I mean, uh, my my response. Um, well, first of all, I mean, I think uh, it's interesting that you posed it in the ways you did and your work with Leaf, but also uh, I think I think the fact that you kind of bought in studio work and research and the academy as well as showed us practice uh, was an interesting way uh, to position uh, the work. But I mean, I think what it, uh, <clears throat> just picking up on what Dean said, but articulating it perhaps slightly differently, I think what the work and the questions you've posed opens up for discussion uh, is, you know, in some ways, the classical binary uh, of the city and the forest. And that's why I think I appreciate the terms you used even to, you know, start the framing through the forest. And so, I mean, I think for the profession much more largely, and I say professions much more largely, uh, but I think uh, landscape must drive this conversation is the notion of, uh, you know, is it the city and the forest? Is it the city in the forest? Is it the forest in the city? Right. And then I think you took us to another scale, which is the house in the garden or the garden in the house or the garden and the house. Right. So, I mean, I think those relationships in the way we even pose and articulate these categories uh, I think uh, uh, is something that your presentation provokes uh, for a much broader discussion. Uh, because uh, I think, I mean, I was there for the first conversation uh, where some of these questions came up, you know, you design the landscape first, you place architecture in the interstitial spaces, you could extend that to the city and you design the ecology, the natural ecology that surrounds that terrain and then place the city within it. Or do we make space within the city for the garden uh, and I mean what Dean called the lungs or you know nature or whatever. So I mean I think uh, uh, I, I think the way you've posed I'm sorry I'll just take one more minute the way you've posed the work um, uh, I think has this amazing potential uh, both uh, both at the level of looking at uh, scalar differences but also looking at ways that one can position what otherwise becomes business as usual binary conversation, right? Uh, and I think uh, uh, what was wonderful of the images you showed uh, of the studies in Ahmedabad is, is those, those, those ecologies in a way sustain uh, and exert their presence, which we often miss, right? And I think reading them and surfacing them, but also challenging ourselves to move away from the binary of the city and the forest or the forest and the city, uh, I think is a conversation that you open up uh, in interesting ways. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Raul. I'm sorry, I didn't even see you coming in. Um, Chaya, is it, would you like to take it now or uh, would, can we move to Rajiv or Meghal or Professor Sauda? Well, well, now, uh, so many things have come up in the conversations up to now. Um, First of all, Anjali, I don't know whether what you, what you or perhaps your students drew can be called representation. It is a direct 
engagement between the place and the person and it's a it's an experience which is uh, which is fructified in the drawing rather than something that puts across information about the drawing that's one um, which i think in perhaps in your imagination you still do even if you are so experienced now that you don't need to draw it but you still need to feel the direct connection with the land do you not yes of course so when i say i don't draw it i mean i draw it maybe in different ways so i'm not yes. yeah yes and it's it's uh, the diagrams follow much later am i right the the division for example of the forest and the city is something which is a uh, construction uh, not originating in direct experience actually that, that sorry yeah, you yeah, yeah well, all i was uh, i was saying for example that when i see a tree outside my apartment it doesn't do something so different uh if i saw it in open land it it still has it still catches me by the guts in the same way and i believe that at the origin of every professional uh action is a kind of a catching in the guts i thought it i saw it in your work i don't know i think uh, sometimes the challenge is when you're looking at landscapes is you know you have to you always draw it in many ways because you you have to that's exactly what that quote was you know you have to kind of draw what 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 it sort of makes you feel and then you also have to like kind of pull it apart to see what's going on so that's part of the i at least i feel that when you're sort of working with landscapes that's like a big part of of all the drawing the thinking and the putting it together so there are people who are rahul said you know would you like to also respond to some of the conversation rahul did or? yeah um so i think one of the reasons uh, i also put across both the uh, the academic the two different academic Yeah. Uh, happens many times is that you, you kind of forget to look at things, okay. especially because I mean all of us are in Ahmedabad. We are from Ahmedabad, and we are here for two years studying landscape. You kind of become blind to a lot of a lot of things that are around you, and uh, also a lot of the times the starting point is to you know be able to look at things in a in a certain way to be able to work. I think that's all I would say at this point. But But Anjali, I mean, I think. Uh, uh, sorry to just jump in, Aniket, because uh, she was responding. But I mean, I think uh, I think there's more than that that you can extract from, uh, or I could extract from the observations of what or the way you posed your work, which is also, uh, I mean, I think the question, which again becomes a question for us as professionals. See, the the, the academy also affords us the luxury in the way you've done. to look at a scale yes. uh, and to be able to discern patterns at a scale which as a practitioner with your eye so close to the ground and your nose so close to the ground you don't even have the luxury to do correct so i mean i think the other question that emerges from your presentation at least for me uh, is 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 these modes of practice right uh, i mean i think a lot of people on this panel straddle those i'm all chaya basavra i mean everyone uh, the aniket i mean all all of us are doing it dean you know we're trying to create these other platforms from where uh whether it's the academy or in the form of leaf or what dean's sort of organization does to straddle these differences which are scalar which are about different forms of even advocacy that might be required but they're also different forms of what i call instruments of advocacy that might be required right and so discerning those patterns becomes i think uh, something as professionals i think your your presentation at least for me opens up that question for us more broadly rajiv 
Raji, Professor Vasavda, Megal. I'll jump in, Aniket. Yeah. Uh, actually, we'll go back to the earlier question of representation. And it sort of struck me that, um, you know, landscape as compared to other things is, is a living, growing, changing phenomena. So how do you represent something that is um, um, sort of more reductive to, say, architectural drawings or in, in, in simple representation? Uh, it, you know, the breeze changes it, the nature of trees changes uh, depending whether it's in Gujarat or it's in Uttar Pradesh in, 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 near the Himalayas. And, and the way that the root systems work and the way that the, uh, the trees sort of grow and the sizes they grow, all of it changes. So it's sort of this sort of ephemeral phenomena. How do you catch it in, in, in any way of representation? I'm, I'm sort of curious to know because I saw such wonderful drawings and uh, a wonderful presentation by you. But uh, I'm curious to know how do you see this as, uh, represent something so ephemeral? Anjali? Yeah, it's, it's a constant question. And, and half the fun is, is trying to do that, you know, and trying different ways of doing it. That's part of the fun of, of trying to draw something like that, which is, yeah. I mean, that's all I would say, because it is always, every time it's a new attempt to, to do it. So, I think that's the good help. Megal has a raised hand. <laughs> sorry, Rajiv, sorry, go on. Yeah. yeah, I'm saying that are there other ways to experience this? Because I think the mode of just drawing sort of limits something like this. I, I can understand uh, architecture being represented in a certain way, but landscape is kind of, you know, the smells of it, the romance of it. There's so much more to it. So, <laughs> <I'm a laughs> <kid. laughs> Agreed. Megal? So, you know, just uh, kind of con continuing that idea of so much more. Uh, one of the things, uh, and uh, I mean, I've known Anjali for a long time. So, I think she'll be okay answering this. Or not really answering, it's not just to Anjali. You know, we've been talking about and we've been looking at projects and landscapes and um, we've been looking at it in a very happy way that, you know, it's bringing joy and uh, happiness. And we always equate this sense of nature in our lives with that sense of bringing happiness. But something that you mentioned earlier, you know, there are two ways of looking. I think you quoted something and you said that it was two ways of looking and the whole idea of the sense of fear and the sense of uh, the kind of apprehension with respect to landscape. And then when you started looking at the landscapes and you started talking about how there might have been something, which means that something that was washed away and that was taken away or maybe even in a, in a, in a, dis a destructive manner. And then you used a term called confrontation. And for me, all these little dots started joining together. And I'm curious to try and understand whether as human beings, do we always crave to be able to construct or to put together something that will always uh, be soft and um, happy and uh, well-being kind of associations with landscape? Or do you think that it can pick up a larger role of uh, creating provocations, creating a kind of a sense of unease also in in the way we have our relationship with that whole idea of built and nature. Michael, I'll, I'll try and answer that uh, a little bit and then Anjali can jump in if she wants to. So I think, you know, historically, if one starts looking at, you know, the late Renaissance, uh, the early Baroque sort of landscapes, you, you begin to actually see uh, that they're laden with a whole bunch of emotions, some of them quite serene, some of them very whimsical, some of them downright vulgar. Uh, but if you look at, for example, the Boboli Gardens, uh, it's also the sense of being scared, the sense of awe, the sense of being, you know, fearful in, in the landscape setting. Uh, there was, uh, there is a Czech uh, landscape architect by the name of Valdemar Sitta, who worked for many years in, in Melbourne, and then he left Melbourne and went back. And the only way to describe his landscapes was that they were angry landscapes. I mean, they were just downright sullen, angry landscapes. Um, I think without any, any doubt, uh, landscape has the responsibility of being able to espouse, expand, address all the human emotions and all the human constructs. Uh, increasingly, I think landscape wants to be happy, as you call it, or landscape wants to be peaceful because it's seen 
as um, something that's a contradiction to the city or the contradiction to life in the city. And that is usually seen as a more oppressive idea, at least in Indian cities. Uh, and the landscape or the garden is seen as a place of refuge. Um, I think it's also got to do with the nature of balance that will begin, that, that, that one tries to strive. If you have a great kind of urbanity, if your cities are expressed much be better, then landscape perhaps will slowly start also taking positions that are not always positions of tranquility. Uh, landscapes might take different kinds of uh, positions. I think right now you're seeing landscape essentially as a response, as uh, an island, as, as getting away. And uh, I think maybe one day when our cities fall into place, we can start doing landscapes that are angry and brash and uh, that's exactly where uh, I mean, in, I, I was coming from in, in some sense that uh, we seem to be preoccupied with trying to find our sense of uh, peace only in the, the trees that we plant. And uh, somehow we don't seem to want to create a sense of a reversal of that re relationship at any moment where by the sense of architecture, even in places which are supposedly designed for the idea of well-being of people architecturally, seem to want to correspond that in the landscape. I'm not saying that we need to be angry landscapes, but I surely I want to look for provocative landscapes. I agree. I fully agree. I yeah. fully, fully agree. Uh, Snail hasn't said anything. Professor Vasaud hasn't said anything. So um, if you'd like to. I, I would just like to connect one thing that was being just said and what Rajiv spoke about uh, here it has a parallel that, uh, you know, the what we draw is often emotion. And that is how I would like to answer uh, Rajiv's question when uh, he was talking about the uh, ephemerality and the so many, uh, um, so many facets of landscape. I think one of the important things that uh, one tends to draw is the emotion and the experience. And in the emotion and the experience, the sensing of space somewhere uh, starts to also uh, happen. And uh, the, 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 the third idea that I thought uh, the presentation brought about uh, was also the idea of uh, context, where in terms of landscape, the relationship, it's microcosmic relationship with its context as, a, as an ecology, as well as as a metaphor. So these two ideas are something, again, which we can uh, discuss on because uh, uh, landscape really affords a lot of ideation on the microcosmic view. <laughs> so, Sunil, I, will, uh, Sunil I, will, I will sort of answer for, for Rajiv and tell you where he was coming from. Uh, there was a time that we were doing the exhibition Death of Architecture and all of us were desperately trying to do panels. Uh, what Raj, and Rajiv was talking about the ruins of Nalanda. And he built a huge installation. And in that installation, you could walk inside the installation and there was sound. Uh, and, you know, the, the sound changed at different ends of the installation. It's a very complicated installation to tra transport, build, all of it. I think what he's really trying to say is that is drawing an, an enough of a tool or whether we should look at other tools also as ways of representing landscapes. I think what, to move on, to quickly move on. Uh, yeah. Uh, Professor Vasavada, um Yes. Thank you, Aniket. No, I think if I reflect, uh, this is the first time that we are looking at a different scale of landscape. So that is something, you know, which was quite, uh, um, you know, it was a, a, quite a presentation on that, you know. The other thing, you know, I'm just listening to the kind of discussions that, you know, that we are having. And, you know, there is a kind of, you know, there is a kind of question coming to my mind. I mean, this is not a question to Anjali or anybody, but I think it is something, you know, which I would like to discuss with you all because you are in the field. And uh, I just wanted to, you know, find out two things. One is, you know, working as a landscape, you know, designer, to my mind is extremely difficult. You see, because I think you are trying to imagine a kind of environment uh, without really knowing the way the nature would really come about. You design things, you see, you design things in anticipation. You know 
the forms you know the material but whether left on its own will it really come to meet with your imaginations that is one thing you know which i have always wondered and then if not what do you really do as a landscape you know designer second is about this idea of emotions you know which is being discussed and if i somehow uh, aniket you were talking about the gardens of italy you know i have been looking at enormous amount of films on you know the gardens you see because i think that country was extremely sensitive along with uh, you know the french examples but you know for example japanese gardens if you see i mean there is a, a kind of sense of some kind of you know emotional play always involved in designing a garden there and the attitude to material is also not always just the plants you see but many other things you know which go with nature the water the the rocks you know the the kind of surfaces the texture now all these are really used you know to sort of arouse or evoke emotions in the minds of people which many a times have tremendous cultural you know sort of connotations now when you think of all this how would a landscape designer begin with a project you see that is my question and when i think uh, she was also talking about the city of andaman i think we have done several studies on this there were you know gardens which were on the north western side of the fortified city there was a very good garden which was slightly outside which only remains now in terms of name which is the fatehwadi and you know obviously there were gardens in in shahibagh you know which was the later period you know a garden designed by shah jahan you know in his youth and perhaps that was the model which he replicated in the entire city of agra so i think in the city of amdabad there were certain traditions and certain you know sort of historical you know precedents you know which were really guiding the entire sort of movement uh, during the mogal era so i think i would really like to understand because how do you really start your work when you are really working on a landscape project you see so this is just in terms of a discussion you see i i don't really want to get into the projects uh, particularly but i think this is a kind of general question you know which i feel to my mind is very important for me to understand this absolutely. is what i would say thank you absolutely now anjali would you like to respond to that oh that's that's a difficult one that's a difficult one best <laughs> to answer <laughs> yes uh but uh i think going back to what meghal said uh, also Uh, I mean, when I when I when I put that question to that garden in Sangam near that I was, I mean, you know, it's 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 also got to do with with the landscape that you're living in, and in a lot of the times in, uh, especially in a lot of these semi in all parts semi arid climates, if you don't do anything to the landscape, it's not a very pleasant place to be in. So so and that's why I kept using that word cultivation because you have to literally cultivate the place. at all scales you know for the garden for the water for whatever so it's 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 not just cultivating plants that you have to do and i think that is partly uh, i would also use that to partly answer what professor saga asked i think that to so you have to figure out these different ways of you know clearly clearly larger questions and yeah. I think one of these days we should all sort of try and address that because how do we design? I think uh, Snail. Before we move on, yeah, I think a lot is being said. So um, I'm only going to ask one question, which I thought was uh, pertinent at some point. That uh, what I saw as when you are recording in your academics, uh, you are looking at top down in some sense. The representation, even if you are starting from the ground up. you know so trunks and everything that is happening but when you're actually doing the practice you're looking at the soil and and there is a rational that seems to be driving the mapping that is going on so it's interesting how um, one kind of a recording that is happening 
is is driven purely from the visual sense while the other is bringing in the left brain or the right brain whichever one that is uh, more rational into the into play uh, and and allowing you to record with which, which is very a uh, very discerning kind of a recording i think and that difference i saw in in your in the manner in which you projected the two projects i thought that was interesting thank you sneha sunit can we move on or would you like to conclude this and invite uh, madhu sunit i think we can still afford that two minutes more uh, to to have anybody else say something that we probably yeah. left out and uh, in terms of this beautiful question about how do we design this best is best not answered the the so this is best not answered that is absolutely uh, uh, well uh, best not answered as a trade secret <laughs> Uh, But there is, there is. Yeah, I, I think I, I don't think it is easy to answer this question. Yes, mm. yes. And that's why I said in the beginning that these are not questions, but these are the, these are the points where I would like to understand. Well, you know, as to how one begins. You know, this is not a question, right. and I, I don't know. seek, I don't yes. seek answers. You know, so so speedy, <laughs> because it has to come through works. You know, I, I, I think uh, one of the things that. Uh, happens is that we look at any act of design as a kind of repair of something that has been damaged. Now, human beings have worked on their land for maybe fifteen thousand years, maybe more, and they have done things to the land. They have built cities. They have built forts. They have done all kinds of things. Often they have erased what was the vegetation earlier. But I think it doesn't really. This is not the only lens through which to look at it. That the landscape is something which brings back what we erased two hundred years ago is one of the questions. or that we built cities and the landscape is its complement is one of the ways of looking at it really speaking it is time that we move into a more sensible relationship of human beings and other forms of beings and there are naturally you can't you can't live with a snake a cobra you can't live with a cobra but you can no need not kill the cobra and i think the whole question of urbanity gardens landscapes etc now we have to lose enough i think and there i think uh, the academic projects which anjali showed are probably very very sensitive to this um, mode of looking at it so i think there is uh, i i would not say the landscape is something by which you heal what we have destroyed etc and there i also agree with mekel that in in some sense it is not necessarily the the pleasure principle alone which works here there is also the thanatos or the death principle which is part of the entire sensing of our relationship to the world to time to place also yeah i leave it at that thank you vichaya thank you thanks for thanks a lot we should move on um madhu would you like to come on good evening thank you for inviting us to be part of this conversation on modern landscape I begin by wondering why Aniket invited us to be part of this initiative, considering we don't identify ourselves as a landscape practice. We were very reluctant to begin with, but he manages to convince us that our work would be able to wider the conversation. That's the reason why we're here.
we wish to use this opportunity to reflect on the work we have been doing over a decade or more and see whether like you know there's any consistent pattern that runs across our projects i begin my presentation there is small studio primarily working on competitions and public projects my team over the last 10 years i'll begin the presentation by showing some of the images which have been haunting us not sure i buy or pick up these images but they do intertwine the man made construct with the natural landscape the perfectly balanced uncluttered and beautiful not sure how one can add anything to these images without diluting the balance this has been our constant endeavor these are the broader approaches and ideas we have been engaged in across projects across scales and across geographies context was a generic conception site as a memory site as not separate and impermanence not that our work is defined by only these things but i find these thing in these parameters to exist in all the projects as constant i'll begin the presentation with a project we won a competition we won in porto is a project to repurpose a decommissioned brick lane on the outskirts of porto on a highway that connects lisbon and porto The site is a representative of any periphery of a city without any definitive identity or character. It's a sprawl. The challenge for us was, what do you do with it? do you assign any usage to it do you provide a public space that could become a place of convergence for people from the surrounds considering the decommission unit was one of the oldest interventions in the landscape the brief did speak about keeping certain fragments of the project as a memory to the place because the area is identified by the company that was decommissioned these are the fragments of the storage walls that are bound the site after carefully evaluating the possibilities we have come to a conclusion that it's it's better that we clean up the place to not do much and create a kind of a world oasis where the place could change as per the needs through the week through the day the idea is to use wall the, the habitable wall which was essentially a storage area for the bricks as a guide as the spaces unfold
for us, it's a, it's, it's a project where we could deploy the idea of doing very less or nothing. Essentially, the project is about cleaning up and uh, allowing the space to mutate and find its own usage rather than defining it by assigning a particular usage. So this is what we, I meant, impermanence, the idea of using fragments from the site as a memory to the place that existed before. All these spaces are on a site. People just could explore, draw their own interpretations of what they could be. This is a representative example for us where theoretically it could be defined by a constructed object and lead the entire rest of the part as void. The second project I'm going to discuss the School and the Social Community Center in Jharkhand. The project is a part of a social initiative of a mining company. The larger question we were confronting was, how do you cite anything in this vast landscape? So you're not allowed to define a territory, you're not allowed to kind of obstruct the natural movement of elements. So after careful study of the site, we, we adopted certain strategies where like, you know, we could preserve all the trees and allow the water to, storm water to move through the landscape without anything and create a infrastructure. I'm emphasizing the word infrastructure instead of a building because there's no assigned definitive usage for this building. It could be a school, it could be a medical center, it could be an emergency shelter, it could be anything. The whole effort is to create something as minimal as possible and allow the natural landscape to dominate. What you essentially get is a matrix of shaded spaces, covered spaces, and defined open spaces. Something we thought critical in a place defined by vastness. This, this place function of this Spaces can vary. The whole idea is to generate a structure, deeper structure without assigning any usage. The next project I'm going to discuss is our competition entry for Bamiyan Cultural Center in Afghanistan. As you're all aware, it's a historic site monumental significance. It's beautiful. Question confronting us was, how does one intervene in this historic context? Does the intervention enhance its quality? Does it draw its quality from the inherent beauty of a larger landscape? After a careful study of the surrounds and the settlements around, we came to the conclusion that the building has to be a low-key building, smaller in scale, sitting lightly on the landscape. 
is just the uh, woman truth that holds everything together this three are is cues are self referential have their own usage that over defining as per the function the idea is to create architecture without content is it possible to do that the next project i'm going to discuss is our proposal for the extension of the who headquarters in geneva the site is characterized by a beautiful landscape overlooking the lake geneva on one side masterpiece of modern architecture the original building of jean shomi how does one add anything to the image without undermining the precarious balance that exists between the landscape and the building all these even like uncharted buildings are essentially objects in a landscape after careful analysis of this around we have come to a conclusion that our addition will be minimal a kind of a non building a roof of which could be used as a public promenade connecting different parts of the sirans the strategy of keeping the interventions low allows an obstructed views from the old building The next project I'm going to discuss is a competition we won in Korea and is currently under construction. The program was to design a art platform in the historic city of Suncheon. The city of Suncheon is 70 kilometers outside Seoul. This diagram illustrates the dichotomy between the built and the unbuilt the perimeter the built links inside the perimeter wall are dense opening up to a mountainous landscape outside the walls these are some of the examples we studied from korea in japan to understand the relationship between the landscape and the architecture so how the voids essentially become the structural elements of dense cities a series of diagrams like you know starting with the existing ensemble that's going to be demolished the program we had to build was mini school compared to the site so as a strategy we thought it's better to create a park at the surface level and put the programmatic requirements underground as a subterranean space
it allowed us to connect to the river, which is at a lower level. And you just have two pavilions on, on the surface level, loving to access to subterranean spaces and also acting as the connectors to the surrounds. Another feature of the project was the subterranean spaces could grow with the increase in requirements without actually altering what happens on the surface. Extremely difficult to distinguish what is an interior and what is an exterior or what's an intermediate spaces this project, they seem to seamlessly connect. There's some of the images from the ongoing construction. The final project I'm going to discuss is a waterfront restructuring the waterfront on Sardinia Islands, Italy. The coastline is characterized by natural features and the harbor. It's almost a green field waterfront visited by tourists only during the tourist season and they set up temporary camps and just leave the rest of the landscape untouched most of the year. Instead of distributing the activities Along the coastline, we decided to restrict the development to five different zones. The intensity of usage varies, connected by a pathway and a bicycle path. The idea is to keep as much of the waterfront natural. And for us, what happens between these zones? is as important as what actually happens in the Jones. Minimal in terms of intervention. We commemorated a stone tower that existed for the last 600 years by creating a cultural plaza defined by an elevated wooden bridge. The idea is to ensure that it weathers and disintegrates into the landscape eventually. I wish to end the presentation by articulating some of the questions which we are still grappling with through our work. What exactly is the role of an architect or a landscape architect in philosophically defining what needs to be done, how much needs to be done, whether it needs to be done or not done? Do as professionals, do we have the ability to control this process. Does practice have to be all the time built? Is there any space for practices which reflect more than what they are? And with professional dichotomy that exists between architecture and landscape, who exactly 
provides the initial vision for the project. We don't know. We have no answers for any of them. I hope some of the discussants and the audience at large will be able to provide some answers. Thank you. Thank you, Madhu. Thank you very much. Madhu, I think uh, you wanted to say a few things before we opened it up uh, to the discussion. So would you like to say, say something? No, I think you can open discussion. Are you sure? Yes. yes. So thank you very much. I mean, I've always marveled at those drawings and um, I feel particularly happy that you've chosen to come and show this work here today. Um, because I do believe that it raises some very, very important questions of how much, where, why, how much not to do, can we, can we walk away, uh, can we sort of not leave a trace, uh, and I think these are important questions, so I'll open it up, uh, Sunit, if you would like to open it up, or? Yeah, four or five uh, points I'll quickly share, which uh, can form uh, some of the uh, some of the backbone of what we've been looking at. So uh, what I felt while uh, looking at this, the first thing uh, Aniket has already said about how much and how much not to. So I will not elaborate on that. The uh, second thing that I was uh, very, uh, very, very interested in was uh, the whole idea of deconstructing this uh, this this notion of what is architecture and what is landscape through a very primordial kind of a lens, where uh, one looks at the objectification of uh, human-centric activity within a larger understanding of the setting. And this was something that came out uh, quite interestingly. And the 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 small diagrams that were the cover page to that formed a cover page to each of those project presentations, in fact, had an answer to all of that. And uh, the other thing that I thought was very uh, interesting here, uh, when we talk about deconstruction and when we talk about objectification, another thing that comes about is the oneness. Of the uh, of the built of the unbuilt of the uh, solid of the void of the nat natural and of the man-made and so on and so forth, where uh, the great quality of ambiguity helps us to bridge all these gaps and bring everything together. And uh, <clears throat> lastly, I also saw the joy of sensing space which formed uh, one of the, it seemed which formed the, uh, uh, the purpose of why engage in anything that we do. That, that joy of uh, creation, that joy of sensing space came about and something that, so that's what I had to say about uh, uh, what Madhu showed us, uh, but something that I had stopped short of uh, muttering, but now I would like to add because that question that was raised about uh, how do we design. So uh, uh, this one aspect which is very close to my heart of not looking at landscape as a source of healing all the troubles of the world and not looking at landscape as something that solves problems and therefore looking at a personal agenda of how I would like to position myself in this present context that I seem to be in. And from a poetic perspective, what is it that I would like to bring to this situation? What is it that uh, the projects may be the same? So you may be doing a, a certain typology, maybe eight times, 10 times over uh, two decades. But the responses are not necessarily because of the type of the project or because of the uh, analysis that comes out of the 
context where it is where you find yourself in the uh, mind and heart space at that moment so yeah i would like to just open it to all the panelists who uh, would like to go yeah okay i go again first um <clears throat> Yeah, Madhu, you said something very thought-provoking, and that was architecture without content. And I, I don't know how one can really achieve that. I'm not misinterpreting it as architecture without context, but you know, without content. Uh, so that really throws up a lot of questions, and uh, it just reminds me of one one building, which is the uh, the airport at Venice, and it's a very ba basic background building, much like you've shown us, and. Uh, it has these squeeze through spaces it has brickwork on certain walls it introduces water in a very interesting way when you move from an upper level to the water down below where you pick up a water taxi and it's it reminds me of your work in a way you know where there is some context to it and, and but it's so there is some thing that links you to what you're about to be to what you are to experience yeah. so yeah it's again it's more of a question of how do we actually bring be minimal at the same time be uh, appropriate to where we're building yeah does madhu want to respond to that yeah, yeah. see i think uh, it happens all the time around us if you visit any of the historic sites like you know they have defied function and they they there's still as some kind of a balance that exists between the built and the unbuilt which is independent of the function and somehow like you know modern architecture has lost that art of making a minimal kind of an intervention which which allows the building to kind of mutate in terms of function it as it is assigned at any particular time for example in rajasthan so many of the forts were converted into hotels and so many other like you know usages how come none of our modern buildings are able to adapt what is the exactly is the problem are we over defining it are we like literally fall form follows function you define a function and then try to take, make architecture around it what is the problem how come the historic buildings are able to adapt and whereas our modern buildings like you know things which were constructed in the 20th century are not able to adapt so this has been something for which i don't think i have an answer but this is something we have been constantly thinking about when we begin a project the process works like this we wanted to find a purpose for the project which goes beyond the assigned function we were supposed to give it to the project that, i think that's something we consciously do do it in every project and there has to we have to find a larger link to the context larger link to the purpose of it and it's just the function is an incidental thing so in all cases the form is never generated out of a program or out of a preconceived kind of a notion yes you are right in the sense there is always an autonomous construct in your head okay this is what like you know perhaps as an autonomous idea it could work and then you position the idea on the side and try and adjust and see how you can adapt it and how can how one can make it more contextual and more specific to this place so that's that that has been our endeavor all the time that do architecture without content is it possible to create spaces yes i think we can like it sometimes we succeed sometimes we fail but but the fact that it, they can be made is something which at least i can watch for that architecture can be made without content also well, what i mean by content is function predetermined function assigning a predetermined function to the project yeah can i say something yes of course sir. yeah um, i i found your work most interesting uh, maybe for reasons different from your reasons uh, so uh, first of all i think all your work tends to to erase the difference between what we call outside space and inside space both are textures of varying density um uh, they have and uh, you hardly make a 
that sharp line so that there is no there is no skin which is punctured but there is a fabric which is perforated and in that sense the fact that you show many of your drawings in plan form is i think indicative of something of that that order but it's a it's a wonderful uh position away from seeing landscape as the as the sort of complement to the man made and it, here there's no no separation that's one very interesting thing now the other thing which is there is that you suggest that the designer's action is minimal and life's action is maximum this is what i draw from your work that life will do things i will only put in in that sense i would i would disagree with sunit that there is a personal uh, proposition that you are putting in a context though you just now said so but i don't think i i i feel there is something else however i was just wondering how about if you made some of your work and this is just a a wild thought coming in my mind and you need not maybe i'll try it somewhere how about like i've tried some things with aniket's ideas so yeah uh, how about any of those things being made with dirty materials you know which which don't stay in place which which have outlines which are not sharp which have which will not sort of hold on and which will therefore bring in a tactility both to the outside and the inside this is something which i think could be an exploration i don't know what you feel yeah th this one we tried in the last project the all the material uh, we were very conscious of the fact that like in we will use material which will kind of like you know weather away mm. eventually Uh, like uh, in, for a bridge, we use like you know locally sourced uh, wood. So the whole idea was not to use a material which will have a la larger life scale also, and which will like you know gently weather into nothing sooner or later. But how about already weathered material? <laughs> 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 Now I'm I'm thinking that you really are are very very clean. <laughs> which 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 is a good thing by and large for human beings but i think sometimes it, it may be a little fun to try out something else just just a feel so <laughs> um, chai remind me of i think it was jitesh's work or somebody else's work which was built out of melting wax yes uh, and you know that piece of work would sit in delhi summer or ahmedabad summer and every season it would melt away a little bit and one day of course it would go so but it seems like <laughs> seems like that's what you're suggesting but uh, rajiv uh, Ra uh, rahul if you're still here professor basavdas neral megal yeah i'll jump in aniket i actually uh, uh, knowing madhu for a long time uh, i quite admire his work of course i think he's done wonderful work very interesting projects but i have a question that you know i've always wondered you know madhu you do all these wonderful projects which are largely or solely based on competitions where uh, you know the human interaction with the client is not there i mean there's a program you sort of do something there's a jury that's not connected to it and so it doesn't muddy anything at all and then uh, and they're done mostly in wonderful exotic locales away from a country like ours which is rather mixed up about many things and so i've always wondered how you would sort of do a practice here what would be the challenges you think you'd face out here where everybody thinks they are an expert in everything you know and and uh, you know how that works so do you consciously refrain from sort of uh, mudding the getting the waters muddy i mean i'm taking off from what chaya talked about materials and taking that up to human intervention now and i'm just curious about that part of it maybe you'd like to respond yeah. and then babu, I babu before you answer yeah so madhu before you answer here is the man Who's won most of the competitions that there have to be won in the last few years in India, and uh, well, is building many of them. 
So I think it's an interesting question. Yeah, I wish somebody gave us the project. The problem is like, you know, nobody gave us the project to do. It's not that it's not a conscious decision that I won't work in India. It's it's only thing is I want to work on my terms and but with my rhythm of slowness. So no client is willing to invest time and energy on it. So taking off from that, I'll, I have another question. I think that's connected to this. Madhu, I know I don't know if the rest know the fact that you have a great farm and that you go every day and you know look after the farm and there is a certain rhythm, there's a seasonality. Uh, you, uh, of course, irrigate the grapes when the time comes for it. You put fertilizer into it and then you prune them once in a while. Now, in that whole act, in some ways, does it affect the way you work in your architectural practice? No, it doesn't. I think that's a getaway from reality. Anyway. So it also, of course, financially sustains one person, but then it's also a getaway from reality. So I think consciously I chose to have another main vocation for existence. And this one I do only like, you know, on my terms and with my own, like, you know, we are doing it. And luckily I found some collaborators who were here initially and then now they're spread all over. So we, we seems to have found a common ground and uh, we decided to work on projects which interest us and which give us a sense of continuity of what we have been doing. Unlike architects, like, you know, I don't say, say anything wrong about it. We are not obsessed to build if we don't end up building many buildings, it's absolutely fine. But every project we work on should give us an opportunity to explore something which is independent of what is a requirement as a program. I think that has been the consistent thing through the work. And every time we refrain from getting into the act of designing immediately, there's a lot of gestation time where we actually question a lot of things. We write quite a bit. And clearly intangible intent is put on the paper and, and the project is only a means to address it. Okay, most of the times we may not end up like, you know, getting what we want. But I think uh, that endeavor is, is not to build, endeavor is not to get the project. If we end up getting like, you know, what we have been doing for the last few years, yes. But I think that has not been the kind of motivation for doing a practice, which is like you can say, is not full hearted, maybe half hearted practice. Thank you. Thanks, Wadu. Thanks, Rajiv. Uh, somebody else would like to come in? Madhu, very interesting work. I, I want to ask one question. Like um, uh, both uh, Nilkan Chaya and Puneet um, were at looking at two different aspects of your work. One was to say that uh, there, is, there is a singularity of approach which is individual and one which is saying it is very objective. I want to know that is the pursuit that you are doing uh, driving it in a manner that defines maybe differences, but there is a singularity of the pursuit. And uh, that pursuit to a certain degree is to define less for sure but uh, would you say that the modern architecture also defines less? You know, so if you look at Aldo Rossi's work, for instance, it does define a lot, very little. You know, it could accommodate anything in it. And uh, so I'm just wondering how you would you look at aspects to it. Defining as an element, as an object, is different from defining as a function. I think, I think at least in our case, the pursuit has been that is it possible to create an architecture one can enjoy without actually thinking that one is going to get something out of it as a function. I don't know whether it's possible. I have no definitive answer, but that pursuit has been singularly to, and also this whole idea of uh, dichotomy between landscape and architecture, whether it is blurring the boundaries. To be very honest, they are never, we are, they were never conscious efforts from our end. My effort has always been to define as less, I think like the whole world is so cluttered, I don't think architects need to make it further cluttered. 
so how do you actually intervene and still do very little in terms of what you do and if it, yeah, whether it serves the purpose or not i think that's been the essence of what we are trying to do thanks rahul would you like to take this discussion somewhere else somewhere else yes <laughs> <laughs> i thought so yeah. No, no, no. I, you know, I just I have two or three comments, which uh, I think uh, Madhu, thank you very much for that. As always, enjoy conversations with you. Um, but I just sort of want to pick up on a couple of things, which in a way also tie up with the last presentation. And I just those are thoughts that were coming to my mind, and they were triggered off really by what Madhu said. And I think the first one is, I think Madhu, what what Madhu showed us uh, made me think about scale because in Anjali's. uh presentation you know we were confronted with uh, let's say the large scale for lack of better word uh, and the scale of the house or her project uh and i think um, now what madhu has introduced and i couldn't help thinking about it through the presentation was a middle scale and the middle scale is also a scale which um, is quite instrumental uh, actually in ways many of these issues resolve themselves because in the to ends of the spectrum of scales things get extracted to specificities whereas in the middle scale one reads a wonderful uh, reiterative quality in madhusudan's work which is you know i mean i i, I can't of, often tell at the middle scale but i mean in your work particularly whether you were first thinking of the landscape and then the buildings were intervening or they were going back and forth in your head in terms of feedback loops you were creating uh, to create finally a calibrated balance between the two you know that becomes very precise uh, and the middle scale somehow allows it uh, and and uh, and extending from that i think uh, you know you kept posing naturally just for the sake of this forum you kept posing architecture versus landscape but i mean i think as i was listening to you i was thinking it's uh, you're posing landscape urban design planning architecture you're kind of trying to provocatively blur between all of those so i think uh, that was what came for more foremost to my mind at least the second point i just want to pick up again uh which uh really comes between the two projects and i think rajiv raised it uh, by talking about representation uh i think professor vasavla when he talked about he took emotions to the place really by looking at japan as an example but also implicit in professor vasavla's comments was the notion of weathering uh because weathering has an emotive quality whether it's the wax installation you were discussing the fact that it's melting is also evoking emotions uh, which then more objectively links to the life cycle of materials right if you want to kind of make it more precise and objective and again i think in both these presentations i you just couldn't help but thinking how you all were intersecting and provoking uh, a sort of uh, uh, you know these ideas Uh, of the temple and so the last thing i just want to say again rajiv while you were talking about representation i was thinking about it and of course you were also evoking smell and emotion but you know i think uh, time uh, just the idea of time or we can call it temporality or whatever but you know we haven't been able to embed this in our disciplines at all uh, and i think uh, in landscape it becomes really evident because things grow and change Uh, and can you capture the change can you project the change uh, you can project it in urban design too right showing how something might grow over 25 years but we don't take that dimension seriously i think uh, the questions you raised about representation rajiv for landscape i would argue that we should challenge ourselves in all our disciplinary uh, uh, variants of of the man made or the built environment in whatever form uh, landscape also is partly a built environment because things are made and altered uh, how do we factor time in there and i think many of the questions i've been hearing in the discussion would intersect very beautifully if we can create that framework to embed, embed the notion of time and challenge us ourselves with that so oh, that's a lot rahul i mean just to add to it what what time i mean is it is it the time of the butterfly or is it the time of of you know sort of the way well, that's going to well, you know cycle yeah no the notion of time is time is changing right so yeah. it's it's change yeah and and the rhythms of time can be different depending on what lens you use you know absolutely absolutely uh so, meghal uh, professor masauda i am a meghal there 
No, I think uh, the question of content is a very provocative uh, question for me. And uh, somehow I'm not very convinced whether it is enough to say that function equals content for architecture at least. You know, I think if you're using the term content, Madhu, then I think that we have to use it for its expandability for many other aspects which are incorporated in the idea of content than to say that it is limited to function. Yeah, I think it is, you, yeah. must, you must say that you don't agree with the idea of a prefixed function and I think that is how it is. Yeah, and there I completely agree with you. No, I think I think that's the case. When I when I when I when I when I when I use the word loosely, what I meant was a predetermined function. Yeah, there there I I completely uh, agree where you're going. That uh, particularly, I mean, in the context that we found ourselves today, the ability for any kind of uh, constructed environment to adapt to the to varying natures and varying situations is something which is very interesting and which is where again the whole idea of time comes into play not just for the landscape but for the architecture also and uh, to some extent i am uh, reminded of anjali's undergrad thesis where she was trying to trace the idea of time in architecture anjali if you remember what we were trying to do through the idea of uh, light and shadow of course, it, I mean, it was a very preliminary and very elementary way of understanding temporality in architecture. But nonetheless, those are tools which are available to us. But for some, some reason, increasingly, I find a lot of attention being paid to the idea of materiality rather than uh, the, the ephemeral and the non-tangibles, which can help, I think, address the question of time. I mean, this is just... Uh, from the top of my head for the moment. Thank you. Uh, Professor Masada? Yes, a uh, lot of uh, points are discussed. And what uh, Megal pointed out was also something which was going on in my mind. That what exactly do you mean by content? When you really talk of, and this is not a question to you, please. This is, I'm just trying to, no, you know, I just, I just, I just, again. No, yeah, okay. no. Can I finish? Yeah. Uh, you see, because I must tell you, I'm not questioning you, okay. nor your work. I'm just trying to understand myself, with myself, your work and what you have presented. Uh, because I think what you are doing may have many lessons for me to learn. That is one thing. And that is for all presentations. You see, I don't really try to question people who work. But at least I want to use that as something which can expand my understanding about architecture, nature, landscape. And this is the purpose I'm attending this. Uh, because I think to my mind, learning never ends. And I think it is always good to learn more and more. You know, your integration or your approach to integration of what you call architecture without content within a given landscape is something, you know, which is very interesting because you are actually, what Rahul used to talk about in earlier also, that you're trying to actually, you know, articulate the built within the, within the spaces that the landscape is offering you. So that is something, you know, which is extremely positive. I think that was very good to, to somehow understand. What I don't understand is, you know, the whole issue of architecture without content. Because to me, you know, I'm just, I was thinking while you were presenting, I was also thinking about such examples we have in history where architecture or buildings or environment, built environment are built where there is no pre predefined function. And I'm just question, I'm just trying to understand. I mean, do you call the large temple halls in South Indian temples as architecture thousand pillar halls? I mean, do you call Ajanta caves as architecture without content? 
I mean, if you if you just consider that architecture has to somehow, you know, be useful to a human purpose, then you know we can also try and understand that why you know buildings were built where there was no predetermined idea about functions, but it was really left for undefined functions for the use of public. You know. So this is something you know which I am trying to understand, and I would really have liked to have, you know, two or three of your projects, you know, together, but with much greater descriptions about how you handle them, and carry forward your argument about this, you know, how you handle landscape, how you handle site. Many of were just computation projects, and I'm sure they were not realized, but still. there was a kind of potential thrown in for realization of these projects i would have really understood you know better because i could see that there were too many projects you know in a short time to sort of go through because for some of the projects you only spoke about few sentences you see and you know it is sometimes difficult but your drawings were immaculate i mean i really like those drawings they were they were evocative so i would have liked to have those drawings on my screen for a little longer you know to sort of to see and perceive you know what you were trying to sort of express so on the whole you know your presentation has given a lot of lot of uh, you know a uh, lot of uh, thoughts you know which one has to assimilate and one has to keep thinking about this you see so it's a kind of new way of thinking about you know built environment and landscape so i really took it at that way you know thank you thank you so much thank you very much madhu uh, professor wasab was not really looking for an answer but uh, is there something that you would like to i'm not looking for an answer yeah yes madhu no so basically like you know i was just when 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 i was referring to the architecture without content i was only like you know thinking about uh, spaces without definitive assigned usage yeah but i think uh, yeah i think it would have been better that uh, it, like if you had gone deeper into the projects and uh, like made people to kind of reflect on that madhu uh, there is shantesh from last time um, as you remember his presentation uh, he's sort of posted a question on the group and he said it was a delight to watch the presentation and they provoked many thoughts but can madhu elaborate on what he understands slowness as perhaps perceived in the context of time slowness is a quality and characteristic of landscape and he's trying to connect his process of working evolution of spatial comprehension and that manifestation of the spaces it means it means so i think he's really wanting to you to comment on the idea of time and slowness and something that Well, Rahul has decided not to talk about this time, but maybe you can. Happy to if you need to anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, the, the, for me, the idea of slowness is about not rushing for a solution. The idea of the like, you know, you just keep looking at uh, something broader in perspective. Any project. Uh, there's a conscious attempt to look at it from a larger context, and then uh, and don't get into the mode of like you know actually defining things. And you, since most of our projects are again competitions, and there is also a definitive timeline, but we drag it as late as possible to define the project. Uh, and as a process, it's it, it it's always important for us to. kind of put it on paper the intangible intent of the project we may succeed we may not succeed that's not the point uh, and then just see like whether the use time as an element to kind of slowly construct what we want to do mentally to drawing to models like all the iterative processes that go with so in, in that sense uh, our mode of work is not suited to a commercial practice in the sense where things are like you know time bound so perhaps that's also one of the reasons why i disengage from doing real time projects so this is the question i want to ask all the discussants 
as a, when, when you talk about practice as a larger thing, is it is a, about only buildings or landscapes? Is there any, any scope or any space in this larger thing or practices which want to reflect more, not necessarily produce more? Of course there is. And I think that is extremely important part of uh, uh, any culture uh, coming into existence is not by uh, concrete achievements alone, but by the actual gropings or uh, actual uh, explorations that a culture does. And I think um, I personally feel that about maybe 10% of what one explores actually gets built. And that's very happy because then uh, there is, uh, uh, and I, I, I practice in a small way, but um, I appreciate your idea of slowness because I'm well known as a very slow architect. But I think that the notion that we uh, have to bring it to a concrete demonstration is not, not a necessary part of practice. I don't think so. Um, and so that, that's one part of it. But I think there is also to the notion of time, there is something else. And that is that our brain works in a way in which uh, the same thing looks different after a day, after a few days, after several days. And I think that maturation of the, of the whole sensing of, of a project is something which is really important and which I think I would call slowness, slowness something of that sort. That's something that becomes a little rounded and matured rather than just a one-off uh, answer. This is where what I saw in your, in your work, which I found quite interesting. And that's why you make good bread, you know. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very slow. It takes time. <laughs> I think Rahul wants to say something. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Just to add, I think what Madhu was saying provoked some a thought. And I think it also relates to what I was trying to put across as the scalar question. Um, and Madhu, you used, well, there are two terms um, I think that you use that you would. Uh, you, you like to take in the context, right? You, uh, you, you let it kind of seep in at some kind of rhythm, uh, which is, I think, interesting. Uh, and uh, so, you know, the way I would frame it, just listening to this and also picking up on things that Chaya was saying, but just to frame it in another way, I think, uh, I think we, and it's partly pedagogy, it's partly the way we operate as architects. Sometimes it has to do with the kinds of patronage that we respond to is we tend to respond with rather absolute solutions, uh, right? And uh, the absolute solution defeats time. Uh, and I think this is how I understood uh, Neil Kanchaya's uh, comments, right? At uh, the, the, the smaller the scale, actually the solutions get more absolute because it gets more tangible in terms of the micro requirements, right? And that's why the middle scale becomes a very fertile ground. Product-like, product-like. Uh, sorry? Like a product. Smaller it becomes scale. a product, right. So the middle scale is a scale where one can actually engage with these reiterative processes. And at the larger scale, the slowness of time takes another kind of dimension, right? And so, I mean, I think one of the challenges, and it could be a very fertile ground for intersections, is the rubric of how do you design for transitions? How do, you, how do we start imagining transitions? And this goes back to Rajiv's point, to what Dean raised, because representation of transitions and even design imagination of transition is different. That means it doesn't lock into one thing. And I think Madhu Sadhan, this is the open-endedness that you're striving for, which is that it's not bound only by function. It's not bound only by the impatience of capital, which is what you called commercial projects. It's not bound by those parameters, but it leaves enough porosity uh, as being a transition to something else. And therefore, how do you create a context within the context that actually propagates the transition rather than locking ourselves into absolute solutions? 
you know, and I mean, a provocation that I've written about is the way I framed it is, as architects, do we often make permanent solutions for temporary problems, right? So then that begins to reframe um, our aspirations quite differently. Thank you. Yes. No, okay. Can I can I can I just say one thing? Of course. Robert? Of course. Uh, you know, in a sense, if you think, each building has areas which are bound by function, and it yes. also has areas which are completely undefined. Yeah. Each building has this. And I think that is the balance, you see, which I think the building would find, you see, because you can never design for transition today. But the building must have some kind of a potential to allow that transition to happen, you know. Absolutely. And this is the resilience, you see. And yeah. I think this kind of resilience is always observed in traditional architecture. Absolutely. So so, so so this is something, you know, which is there always, you see. Yeah, yeah. So and there actually, is a content. Yeah, sorry. No, no, sorry. sorry. No, I just wanted to say then absolutely. And that's when then you start seeing architecture, which the hints, I mean, the way they're not hints, but it's very clear in Madhusadan's work where you see a kind of superstructure or an armature that does something, but it allows a substructure to corrode it. Uh, to occupy it, to change it. Uh, and, and, you know, we complain as architects, well, life does corrode architecture, there's no question about it. But, you know, we, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's such a common despair among architects, look what's happened to our building, look what they've done to our building. Because we haven't, I think you're right, we haven't created the resilience, we haven't created the, the space uh, for that function to change and to corrode it in some ways. Yeah. No, I think we have many historical examples you see where yeah yeah of course no, a, i'm a, talking about contemporary perfect, talking. no no even in contemporary for example yeah. mises work you know yeah i mean yeah. it really shows you see that there could be a specific function but at the same time the same thing could be really completely open without any yeah. function yeah, when I say contemporary building, I meant yeah, buildings, yeah. and this is where Mad Madhu Sadhan's uh, thesis is very powerful, is that mm -hmm. if it is very tightly bound by very specific yeah. functions which have validity yeah. only in a specific time, uh, yeah. then that resilience has just gone out of it. I no, think that, there is no it, resilience. Yeah, sure. There's no resilience at all, yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Sunil, this is a, I think we've, sort of, this has been the longest, despite me cutting short my introduction, so... Matsuni, would you like to wrap up the day, sir? We all have uh, many, many wonderful thoughts to go back uh, with, and I should not add anything more to the beautiful weekend that's unfolding. So thank you all for such thought-provoking presentations and uh, discussions. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you again next Saturday. So thank you very much and thank you Madhu, thank you Anjali, thank you all the discussants, all the audience and please come back next Saturday. Thank you very much and good night.